nobody can deny that we're living in a time of unprecedented change. Whether it's the climate, pandemics, AI, or political unrest, there are a lot of events that have us confused and wondering how to make sense of it all. My name is Rebecca Burnt, and I'm asking the big questions, like what is the long history of our planet and its people? What are the ideas and practices that help us find purpose and meaning and navigate change with courage, faith, and hope? This is the unfolding Faith Beyond Borders. I'm Rebecca Burnt, and in today's episode, we're going to explore the interesting resurgence that Christianity seems to be having. Despite a decades-long decline in professed affiliation and church attendance numbers in Europe and North America, the last few years have brought a spate of high-profile conversions to Christianity from artists and intellectuals. People like the musician Nick Cave, environmental writer Paul Kingsnorth, and most recently the former Muslim and former New Atheist Ayan Hirsi Ali. In addition, the New York Times has declared, somewhat questionably in my opinion, that a small cadre of podcasters and influencers is making the Catholic Church, quote, New York's hottest new club. The mo beloved millennial novelist, uh, Sally Rooney, has written characters who profess admiration for Christianity and even attend mass in between bouts of semi-casual sex. Former secular feminists like Mary Harrington and Louise Perry are now questioning the sexual revolution and finding a renewed appreciation for the traditional Christian virtues of monogamy and chastity. And the popular historian Tom Holland in his best-selling book Dominion has persuasively argued that most of the modern values we take for granted, things like human rights, the value of the individual and social justice, owe their genesis to a 2000 year old revolution initiated by one Jesus Christ. As a lifelong Christian, I and many of my friends have been quite intrigued by these developments. It's kind of nice to have your frequently maligned belief system become a hot new trend. But like any trend, the risk is that it proves to be nothing more than a flash in the pan, a momentary fascination that fails to develop any deeper roots. If you read some of these why I converted to Christianity statements that are being published, some of them seem to be rooted in a sense of despair and bewilderment of the current state of the world and a desire to return to an earlier, simpler era where there were perhaps fewer personal choices available to the individual, but more social stability and cohesion. Now that's fair enough. Wanting stability and safety is a perfectly valid reason to convert and Christian faith and practice can certainly provide some much needing grounded and comfort, grounding and comfort. But if we think embracing Christianity is about reclaiming some ephemeral golden age where everything was arranged just as it should be or promoting a pol particular political agenda, I think we're missing the point. As C.S. Lewis said of his Leonine avatar for Jesus Christ, Aslan, he's not a tame lion. If there's anything the gospels teach us is that Jesus rarely leaves us safely in our comfort zones. I was raised from birth in a charismatic evangelical church and I've been an Episcopalian slash Anglican for 20 odd years. During that time, I've struggled with a lot of doubt and frustration with Christian theology, community and praxis. Like Ross and Rachel and friends, I've sometimes had to take a break from Jesus even though some part of me knew we would end up together in the end. I've explored a pretty wide range of Christian expressions all along the theological, liturgical, and political spectrums, as well as other faiths and spiritualities. I've learned that there are elements of beauty and depth, as well as potential pitfalls to be found in all of them. It remains to be seen whether this Christianity boom, I'll call it that, in the media class trickles down to the general public, but I wanna explore the complexities of this moment the promise and the danger with someone who has been thinking deeply about faith and spirituality and practicing Christianity for a long time. Elizabeth Oldfield is my guest today. She's the former director of Theos, a UK think tank and the host of The Sacred, a podcast that interviews thinkers and artists from a wide range of religious, political and cultural perspectives and asks them to reflect on their sacred values. She appears regularly in the media and writes a substack called Fully Alive. Her first book of the same name will be published in 2024. Welcome, Elizabeth. It's really lovely to be here. <laughs> Thank you. Um, let's just start off by maybe I want to I'd like to ask you, what is your own faith 
journey story? That's a big question, Rebecca. <laughs> <laughs> Let's try and be concise with this. Um, I have a different, uh, calls it spiritual autobiography. I um, was raised in, I would say, a very uh, middle of the road, very loving family in uh, in the countryside in southern England and there was definitely the remnants of cultural Christianity in the air in the way that I think was still quite normal in the 80s I was kind of baptized uh christened in fact because that's what you did um but my mum's family and my mum were in no way uh Christian or religious didn't believe in God and my dad I think I certainly perceived him as having not much going on in that department. I now think he probably did, but it was very quiet and he is a very private man, but there was no conversation about God at home. Uh, we were taken to the local Methodist church Sunday school for what I now realize was free childcare. So they would just dump and run, go home and have mommy and daddy time um, for a few years, but it was very small, very elderly, very boring. It was not, my cup of tea. So um, that didn't last very long. And then in my teens, I was taken to a festival by a friend who fancied a boy in her church youth group. And she said, you know, you, you have to come and see this boy that I've got a crush on um, and got involved in their youth group and was taken away to a big uh, charismatic evangelical festival and started very skeptical and then had a really profound uh, ecstatic experience would probably be the sociological term for it which uh, was the hinge of my life, I would say. Um, I then lost my faith in my 20s uh, for intellectual reasons. I hadn't really lined up my my thinking and feeling and uh, had a quite short-lived period of attempted atheism and then found my way back through the highways and byways of different wings of the church. Thank you. And can you tell us a little bit more about what's your kind of current context now? Like, do you worship somewhere? Are you a member of a congregation? Mm. What does it look like for you? Yeah, I'd say I have two centers of gravity. We, um, my husband and I and our kids uh, made the decision a few years ago to live with another family in what I sometimes call a micro monastery. So we live in um, a very small intentional community with um very loosely monastic rhythm. So we're quite inspired by a movement that's sometimes known as new monasticism. And so we have a rhythm of prayer and hospitality and um, relationship and I hope discipleship um, in our home. And then we are also members of the local Anglican parish church. Nice, nice. That's that's interesting. I've also lived in some communities inspired by, by new monasticism as well. And I'm very familiar with that movement. Let me ask you, um, why do you think we're seeing this renewed interest in Christianity at the moment? Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and do you see that interest reflected outside of just the media classes, but in the, the wider public? Yeah. So I'd probably answer this question with two hats on. One is my kind of former think tank hat, which is we in no way can substantiate this in the data, hopefully yet. <laughs> um, and these kind of, uh, civilizational turning points often do take a while to show up in the data but I have been saying for probably 10 years that I feel like something's on the turn in the UK there's been a lot of um the narrative has been very much one of decline as as you said and I've gone yes I can see that in the numbers and everywhere I go people want to sort of sidle up to me and want and want to talk about their deep metaphysical longings and and what it might be that um Christianity has to offer them. I very, I've lived my life in those kind of media circles. So I'm not a representative sample. I did um, the beginning of my career at the BBC and still, uh, you know, we live in South London in an area that has a lot of people in it who are um, working in the creative industries. My husband is a philosopher, so we intersect with academia a lot. Um, but in those circles, I have been seeing for a long time much higher levels of spiritual openness than I would have recognized a decade before, much higher levels of curiosity. And I've pondered a lot what's driving it. And I think it depends which tribe they're coming from. 
And the very visible ones uh, that people are seeing kind of public conversions of uh, tend to be coming from the center right. And that I do think um, is, uh, so, some of them would articulate similar reasons to Ayan Hirsi Ali's um, reasons that there is something about the way we've set up society that feels deeply wrong. We need to um, reacquaint ourselves with our traditions. We need to find institutions that work and are robust. We need to develop a sense of character and virtue um, and that those things don't actually come naturally. They need to have a container um, and, you know, soil in which to grow. And many people are, are, are at least get interested for that reason. I think Jordan Peterson has had an enormous effect, particularly on men and his uh, willingness to take the scripture seriously. Um, have again, just it, just it just changed the sort of um, social permissions, you know, it re re reduced a lot of stigma and allowed um, a lot of people to feel less sh ashamed about having a longing for divine love. And then on the left, I think a lot of it is a confluence of climate anxiety. There is a sense in which uh, that unfolding crisis is existential. And so it forces existential questions to the surface. And then honestly, psychedelics. So many people come to our community and want to talk about Jesus because they've taken a lot of mushrooms. That's really funny. You know, I know people who um, have experienced Jesus on mushrooms. And actually, I'll say, I'll just say a little bit about my own experience, because I, you know, it's interesting. It seems like a lot of this, like, um, the intellectual drive behind this renaissance is coming from the UK more. Mm. And I wonder if part of that is that you all, you've had this, this narrative of decline and this sort of trend of decline in Christianity we're starting to see it here in the US. Yeah. It's absolutely falling off. Um, and amongst evangelicals as well. The main line has been declining for a long while, which tends to be mm. more center left. But mm. then evangelicals who tend to be, you know, to the either center right or very right wing um, have also been declining. And interestingly, I, and I've talked, um, we have a, a guy, Ryan Burge here in the US, who's like just the top like sociologist of religion that mm. knows all the data. And um, he has, he's, he said that there's actually starting, you're starting to see an alignment where people are identifying as evangelical for political reasons, even if they don't yeah, go, to don't church. go to church and even some of them aren't Christian, they might have a different faith, but yeah. they're saying that they're evangelical, which is really interesting. So we have very not a British phenomenon. <laughs> yes. It's a very, I, you know, I always think that like Britain, you guys ex exported all your religious fanatics. Sure. <laughs> we're sorry about that <laughs> but um but yeah it, it's an interesting thing for me because I grew up in a you know very conservative politically conservative um and theologically conservative like uh evangelical charismatic environment and then I went way to the left in my adulthood and now I'm like trying to find like a little bit of a middle ground where I can appreciate evangelicalism for what it offers even though I'm still very much uh like I love the liturgy I'm you know very Anglican I think you can uh, be both I feel I feel both we, we don't have to pick <laughs> Totally. Well, and I think one of the things that's interesting about the UK, the just the you because you don't have the quite the same breakdown mm. with politics and stuff in in religion that we do, and certainly the Church of England, you've got evangelicals. You know, you've got mm -hmm. Nikki Gumbel who started the Alpha Course that we were doing in my evangelical church when I was growing up, and then you've you know also got you know you've got the other side of it. Um, so anyway, all of that is going into. I'm trying to remember what I was going to say mm -hmm. here. Um, I had a thought about this, um, just that, well, just, I was saying that this is this, I'm wondering if maybe the, a little bit more of the intellectual drive is coming from the UK right now, just because you guys have had, have a little bit more distance from it. Like mm. here, I, we still, I think have so many people who are struggling with being raised either in a, in a, you know, intense church environment or just in a, in a milieu where like, if you were raised in the South, we call it the Bible belt, right. Where everyone's just very religious. There's a little bit more reaction to it. Yeah. Um, but I, I am seeing some of the same, I think, hunger and interest in spirituality, especially in places like New York or LA where I've lived. Um, when I was in Los Angeles, the community I lived in there, I helped to run a centering prayer group, which is a Christian form of meditation. And it was really interesting to see how people 
might come just for the meditation, but then they would sometimes end up getting interested and in, more interested in Jesus, you know? Now there are a lot of people also kind of finding, seeking a way out of, out of um, maybe their fundamentalism and kind of on their way out of Christianity as well. But one of the things uh, that I find, what do I want to say about this? I think you're right about the 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 way um the UK has had longer to see what happens when the values that many of us who value kind of liberal democracy want to live by are asked to stand on their own when you have individualism sort of individual freedom as the last remaining uh, widely salient moral call. Um, it, and that's not to say that the US is, you know, record of public religion and what, what it, how it engages with politics over the last, over the 20th century was necessarily a better path. But uh, I think you, you what we what what I see in the UK, and I saw this when I was at the BBC, is you had a generation of culturally influential people raised when the secularization thesis was a given. You know, that as societies industrialize, they will secularize, that we are on this kind of Whiggish upwards progress um towards the promised land of uh the light of reason dawning in our midst. And um it's it's that the the curdling of those hopes, I think, the dis the disappointment of realizing that we were not headed where many people thought we were headed, um, that we have we have we have been within for a while in the UK. This sense of is that is this it? <laughs> you know, you know, we don't have that strong a national story anyway. We don't have the American dream or the French dream. We're very kind of the people who have sort of fudged along, you know, not writing anything down, <laughs> taking the nice middle way. It, it, we, we, the, 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 the lack of a story in which to locate ourselves, the lack of a sense of a trajectory um, has been in the cultural air for longer. And therefore, I think... Um, the way that disorientates and 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 um demoralizes actually over time has become evident sooner maybe mm. yeah yeah that's really interesting well it's really interesting because i never thought about that the fact that the uk doesn't necessarily i mean when it comes to national identity i i think from an outsider's perspective we think Britain is such a has such a distinctive brand, you know, like like we have lots of signifiers, right? We have tea and phone boxes and Mr. Darcy. But right. like what our nation is for, right. we, we have this, this really conflicted relationship with the past, rightly, I think. Both like the first, many mother of parliaments, you know, empire question mark. Just like <laughs> very not. And and that is also our glory, right? I'm sort of reasonably patriotic, and I I I, I value, I, I'm I'm quite suspicious of the sort of visionary ideologies of of nations, and I think it's probably healthy, in the main, to not quite know what you're for. And for every time a politician wants to go, these are British values, everyone else to go boo. Um, but it 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 means that um, existentially, if you don't have a religious faith, where are you going to find meaning? It is, uh, right. it, and everyone will everyone will laugh at you and 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 get sarcastic if you get any clo anywhere close to earnestness. Like the irony culture um, is endemic, and that means that for a very long time there was just no, particularly when the new atheist debate were very loud. There's just no public space whatsoever to say, "I really hope there's a God who loves us." Now there is. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's so. You know, one of the things that I see too is just the way in which, you know, this narrative of progress, which itself is in some ways, it's very Christian, this sort of like utopianism, this idea that we're like headed towards the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. um, it, when it's kind of detached from that, like I think wider story that's talking about like who we are as a people, who we are together, giving us that collective identity. When we talk about things like um, 
person like individual rights and personal freedom it's like well well what are they for what are they for because i can endlessly self actualize and yeah. It's like, what am I self-actualizing for? If it's not, I'm becoming something so I can be in service to others and in service to this whole. And I, I know like there's, I've been in a lot of new age spaces and I love a lot of like new age type things, but you know, we, we like to talk about the oneness or the collective, but it feels so vague and undefined. And, you know, in Christianity, we've got this beautiful theology of the body of Christ and that we have each, we have many members, each does different things and somehow we all work together. Mm. Um, and I think, yeah, there's a lot of those metaphors and narratives and stories that get kind of lost when you chuck it all out the window. And I think a lot of people right now are starting to realize like, none of this stuff that we're doing matters if it isn't all kind of like for one another and if it isn't somehow working together. Yeah, and that it's really, really hard to do that. You know, one of the things we talk about in our house is where we're in a lot of conversations with other people who want to live in intentional communities when the wider conversations about community I have very good friends who are polyamorous and we have like extremely parallel conversations um, because polyamorous households also are looking for ways to, to set up in similar ways. But the, the, it comes out again and again and again to the to the emotional stuff, to the human stuff, to the relational stuff, to the how do we overcome ourselves. And honestly, I don't know that we could do it without the fact that we have centuries of reflection on how you live together. And we have this book, I'd say the vast majority of the New Testament is how do you live together? <laughs> how do you love each other? What does it mean to overcome your best self? How do you build courage? How do you build patience? How do you build gentleness? And I think those my friend Casper calls them spiritual technologies, which I don't love, but is a helpful way of thinking about what are these gifts and these treasures that I can't speak for other traditions, but I certainly find in my tradition that you have a very psychologically astute understanding of how humans work and how we actually change. And I think that sense in which secular society doesn't offer that, mm -hmm. that all these self-improvement programs, all these individual self-willed um you know, well-being programs or um, ambitious routes to success, they're, they're, they're thin and mm -hmm. that there is something thick and something rich about what the, our great wisdom traditions offer as an alternative. And that is, I think, what people are getting interested in. Yeah, absolutely. Let me ask you, when you look at this kind of trend that's happening of people becoming interested in Christianity, what do you see as like the promises of it? What are some things that excite you about it? And what are some things that maybe concern you or where you see some, some potential pitfalls? Yeah. I mean, people encountering divine love is like the quickest way to make me cry. It's really, you know, I'm that, that that's my jam. I am, I am, uh, I sort of unashamedly glad when mm. someone comes to believe that they are loved uh, by something beyond us. Um, and so any, 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 anything that's making that genuinely happen or making that easier for people, I think is worth celebrating. Um, and I do feel, I have felt for a while, yeah, I, so, so, like, you know, the Holy Spirit blows where it blows and you can't tell where it's coming from or where it's going and there's been the wind the wind has been on the change and now it's beginning to blow pretty hard um and i you know we walk with a lot of people and i talk with a lot of people who are who that's where they are and that, that wasn't true 5 years ago or 10 years ago and that's just pure joy um the way we talk about it in public that f can scare me and so um you know i was on another po podcast um recently talking about Anne Hersey Alley and I I said no originally because I was like what people who are feeling groping their way in the dark towards a possible like do not need is everyone else analyzing their every step right <laughs> like that right. the the temptation in these culture wars to claim people for our team and stick, stick a flag in them and then make them representative of whatever our own agenda is and I think she's particularly vulnerable to that because she's a woman of color and uh coming from a tribe that really wasn't that mm -hmm. and it, it 
any any new convert is 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 vulnerable. I, I spoke to Paul Kingsnorth and I was like, I'm praying for you because when you spectacularly convert, then Christians don't want to hear it when you hit the dark night of the soul. <laughs> you know we want you always to be the enthusiastic new convert that makes us feel warm and fuzzy um so yeah I feel like we can both be glad and mm -hmm. cautious mm -hmm. and I joked to someone the other day I don't know that I necessarily mean this but I joked to someone the other day to say like anyone who uh converts should be immediately told by their pastors or their leaders not to mention it in public for like three years or, you know, long enough for the honeymoon period to wear off and for you to go, yeah, this is it. This is real. I'm walking this path. Um, yeah. And not, and, and then have, have enough kind of deep roots of maturity not to be swayed by what everyone else is saying about you. Yeah. I mean, I think that's kind of fair because in the early church, they had like a three-year period of catechesis, I think, before you were baptized. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I mean, yeah, I think, I think like in the second, third century, that's, that's what they were doing. Um, there's might be some wisdom to that, you know, it might be a little bit too long for, for <laughs> these days, but, um, yeah, I, I've had some of the same thoughts and it's, it's both exciting to see people discover this and especially coming from the U S where our religion is so politicized, there's definitely, I definitely have some fears around seeing it just become another political kind of football yeah. um, or a club for, you know, a certain yeah. or, or to, you know. to be completely co-optive for a political project Absolutely. or for people who might be having these questions and longings to think I can't do that because I'm not right wing. Like right. there is a real, I think at the moment, um, probably because there's more, air cover for them but I am seeing equal numbers of people on this journey from the left and the right but only those who are if not straightforwardly right like acceptable to this right and center right are the ones coming out publicly because mm -hmm. and that's partly because of the mess that the left is in right like the <laughs> Martin Shaw has spoken about this a bit around his conversion that because he came out of this kind of um pagan slash new age slash animist world where you know his storytelling and his ancient myths and his um wilderness vigils that he did that tribe was much more comfortable with that then when he came out and said i'm a christian he's lost a lot of friends and he's lost a lot of business and he's lost a lot of connections with his tribe so i, I can understand why fewer voices for whom that's who their friends are feel able to come out in public but the risk is if we don't hear the story happening in different tribes then people think it's only about one thing and it's only about politics and that is a lot of the discourse i think about the recent ali conversion partly because of how it's been framed but also they're like okay great you know this is about civilizational war and oh, i don't see that in jesus <laughs> no, no, I agree. <laughs> yeah yeah, I mean, that's that's interesting. I think, too, there's a thing where even if you do come out, uh, like for me, okay, because I'm in the U.S. where I I was at one point part of super, super, like, you know, hard left kind of social justice, spiritual scene where, uh, and a lot of Christians have gone in that direction. And I think to the point where they're almost like, you know, like there, there was, there was a church that like stopped doing Bible study and started doing just like reading Das Kapital together and stuff like, uh, you know, I think to a point that is almost like abandoning Christianity a little bit, but because I've critiqued some of that stuff, it, it's like we, right now with the left, there's this paradigm where if you're not on board with like all these things, then that just means you're right wing. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's almost, and I, I see a lot of people who they end up publishing in, outlets that I would consider more center right, like the spectator or, you know, unheard or whatever, because there's just nowhere else for them to publish, even if they don't consider themselves yeah. they're, or they're not, you know, they're not right wing. Um, so it's, that's, I think, kind of a, a problem right now in both, it seems like the US and the UK. Um, and also seems like our media ecosystems are increasingly becoming more enmeshed. enmeshed. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think, I think that that is, 
that is like a conundrum that people face. And I, and I would hate, I would hate for anyone to think that um, as a leftist, as a progressive, that Jesus isn't also available to them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let me ask you, like looking at this kind of polarized moment that we're in politically and culturally at the moment, um, how do you respond to that as a person of faith? And how do you, do you think religion or faith, spirituality has anything to offer that? Or has yes, any- I do. <laughs> okay. Let's see. Yeah. So this is this kind of thread through um, the podcast that I host, which is called The Sacred, which really came out of um, 2016 and 2017. And I just had this uh, it was it was actually very strange it was a sort of confluence of two things I went on maternity leave um for the second time and I had a toddler and a baby and so I was reading a lot about child development and fight or flight and um kind of what does it take to 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 parent well with a creature whose brain is not fully grown and what does it mean to help them with their emotions and help them navigate when they are triggered and at the same time I was watching the world and thinking hmm like this is seems to be happening on mass everyone is in fight or flight everyone is seeing other people as an enemy everyone is feeling like a victim everyone is um making poor decisions and not able to draw deeply on empathy not able to be curious you know what is happening here so it was parenting that drove me into this kind of concern around peace building and then I started reading <laughs> very late ridiculously the Christian peace building tradition and realized that this is so central to the ministry of Jesus. He is someone who crosses divides. He is someone who is always seen with the wrong person, right? He is, he'll go into any situation and be like, who is the biggest outsider? Who is everyone else going to have a sharp intake of breath if I go and speak to them? Let's go and speak to them. You know, it's almost, he's very playful. I always imagine him a bit like Fleabag, just like winking to the camera and like, I am going to upset the apple cart of these social norms here and be seen with whoever it is I'm not supposed to be seen with. And then when he speaks about turn the other cheek, this sense I had as I was reading was how much that is this incredibly strong resistance to fight or flight. You know, when we feel attacked, we can choose to fight back we can choose to run away and that is what our body is probably telling us to do or we can choose to stand and keep eye contact and stay in the relationship and there's there's so much richness and depth in the in the peace building tradition um that comes from the new testament and that has been used by millions of people who wouldn't call themselves christians that um i am convinced that is one of the things that we are supposed to steward and offer to the world not with a price tag and not with conditions we're supposed to just say there's practices here there are postures here that we can adopt that make it easier for us to build a common life where we can actually thrive rather than when we're at each other's throats all the time yeah absolutely what are some of the um what are some of the things that you've read you've read like what are who are some of the authors or the the specific resources you've gone to for that so I think a lot of it, um, John Paul, John Paul Lederach is, is probably my kind of biggest, um, draw and Parker Palmer, who's, a, who's a Quaker, both talk about these practices, but I read a lot of James Baldwin who was doing it in this very narrative form, just had these very instinctive postures about what does it mean to be with people who hate us and, stay committed to love for them. Um, and a lot of Dr. King and the civil rights movement just, I think example par excellence of what it means to embody these practices. What does it mean to um, to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us and turn the other cheek and seek the good of the nation to which we're called? These these incredibly demanding and costly and robust postures that do not come naturally and that we have to practice and we have to practice in community and we have to be part of a story that tells us why on earth we would bother rather than just be like you know I'm just going to live my life contemptuous of those over there because they are that those people are beyond the pale which is what every other formation that we submit ourselves to is telling us yeah that's so interesting so I'll I will say I when I lived in LA, I was part of a community um that had some 
organizers who were very, very big into nonviolence. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, uh, the founder of the community that I lived with ended up founding a whole kind of organizer training program mm -hmm. that um, helped to seed a lot of movements and in fact had a big impact on the development of uh, Extinction Rebellion in the UK. Mm -hmm. And his, one of his big things was uh, they had developed a whole kind of uh, story and pedagogy around uh, what they called strategic nonviolence, trying to decontextualize nonviolence from its faith-based or religious roots and mm -hmm. just make it... Um, so skills. Right, make it skills. And the thing is, it what's interesting is it, it was such a struggle for them to do what they called maintaining nonviolent discipline. Like mm. it was in protest movements that they were mm. trying to influence and be a part of because and from my perspective, and I'll say, um, you know, some of the people who were developing this were themselves Christian and, and had that background, but they felt like, well, we've got to just like remove the Christianity part and just make it about strategy. And I get that. But my observation was that like, if you don't have some of the deeper faith commitments, it becomes really hard to justify why you're going to maintain nonviolent discipline mm. when, you know, the police are shoving you or, you know, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. It is. And it's not that Christians are like naturally less scrappy right. or right. easily triggered into you effing you know yeah. like it it is I think it's the deeper why because right. strategy is a very like <sighs> strategy it feels to me like I'm, I'm not gonna we talk a lot of nonsense about neuroscience right and I'm about to do so um <laughs> trigger warning but my my feeling is that strategy sits in that quite analytical um part of our brain when we are able to problem solve and we are able to think long term when you're in fight or flight that part of your brain is shut down right it is literally there are no, there's there's no pathways to it mm -hmm. your limbic system is in charge and that is all about threat response and it's how do i keep myself safe or yeah. how do i flatten the other guy and if if in in that moment of fight or flight you do not have the incredibly short-term why which is you who are attacking me mm -hmm. are made in the image of god and i am called to love you and even if this is strategically nonsense even if even if i die even mm -hmm. if our cause fails this is still the right thing to do i think that can often doesn't like again christians i don't know if we have a better track record at this than anyone else but we at least have an immediate why as well as a long-term why which is this is the call this is the sacred work and it's and it and it and it, if strategy is one of those things that's really hard to motivate a life around totally absolutely because it's really easy to make a case for why doing something else is strategic for one thing and and um, and you can't always evidence it and you've got a theory right. of change right, right. <laughs> what if you're wrong i'm not going to sit here and let myself be punched if your strategy is wrong like right. right i think and i think also you know in addition to that sort of why that 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 theological or ontological why we're not we because this person's made in the image of god there's also i think the fact that spiritual practices going back to neuroscience mm. do help us to regulate our nervous systems help us to sort of like quiet that default yeah. mode network in the brain that's constantly obsessed with like oh my god what's gonna happen what's gonna happen like what happened you know like yeah. holding on to grudges and obsessing over the future and and just to see other possibilities I mean that was that was a big thing for me when I started just doing regular meditation practice and things was like all of a sudden my world opened up and and things kind of became magical and amazing because it was like my mind could perceive yeah. things and perceive possibilities that weren't there before um and so it's interesting because I know that this particular group of organizers that I'm talking about, they've tried to like encourage people to do like meditation practices and they've tried to, it's interesting in some ways they've even tried to like replicate some church like elements, like a lot yeah. of them, even if they're not Christian, yeah. um, love, love uh, 
studying like missional church organizers because they, yeah, they're, yeah. oh, they're brilliant. They're brilliant. And we can learn so much from them. But one thing that I've observed, and it, it, I could never quite make sense of this until I got more into Rene Girard's theory, which when he talks about, I don't know how familiar with it you are, but like with the he, mimetic desire, mimetic desire. And one of the things he says is like, um, you kind of need an external mediator, mm. like, so that you're not just having all your desire mediated through your peers, right? Like there yeah. needs to be an external mediator. And that's kind of what you have in spiritual and spiritual yeah. communities is you've got God, Jesus, even in 12 step, you've got the higher power as that's the focus of your desire rather yeah. than one another. And so, you know, right now, one of my friends who's lifelong leftist organizer says, I would not tell anybody to go into activism right now. It's a shit show. Yeah. It's just complete mess. Yeah. And, um, and so I've been I'm like, yeah, I, I think, you know, one of the things that was so powerful about the civil rights movement is that it was rooted in the black church yeah. and it was rooted in these communities that were absolutely formed by adversity, but had to develop resistance and a collective strength in the midst of it. And a strength that wasn't just dependent on them as humans, but on something bigger than them. Yeah. Yeah. We have a lot to learn. The black church. <laughs> I have a lot to learn. Um, yeah. I think it's hard to talk about this stuff, right? Cause it can, it can sound judgy in ways that I don't think either of us mean it because yeah. it sounds like we both have activists who are not religious and progressive friends and people who are doing way more than I am to yeah. fight for the causes of justice who are embodying, I think Jesus is called to protect the vulnerable and to work on the stranger much more actively than I am. And it would, it would be easy for me to say, well, you know, you're not doing it properly because <laughs> you don't know Jesus. I, I, I want to both be learning from them and, and can see the same thing you see as how much, how easy it is to burn out and how hard it is to maintain um, that path without, without something to steady yourself in, without a source of external strengthening and love and um, a sense of being some one small part in a sort of long unfolding story. I think it's really easy for activists, understandably, to tell this like, we have to save the world and we have to save it now. And that's just crushing, it's crushing weight on a human being. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Oh gosh, I think about so many of my friends that, um, are still in it and and probably are, ha, do and have done way more than I ever have for uh for activists or social justice causes and and I know that they're doing good work and I try to support them and 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 value them and um and a lot of them are people of faith you know are are if not religious deeply spiritual but for me I've had to come back to this place of saying like this none of this really depends on me um, not to say that that I have no agency or responsibility, but I've started to try to orient towards instead of, and this might sound like a little, um, I don't mean this like in a, in a, that I don't value others, but if I think of it as I'm responsible to God before being responsible to others, it's mm -hmm. my understanding is that God is the one holding the yeah. whole thing together. God is the one who has us all in his arms. And I don't know where I'm going to, I can't do it all. So yeah. I have to do what he's given me to do. And, and yeah. if I just look to other people, again, it's that mimetic desire thing. It's easy to think because this person is acting in a certain way, you know, being an activist, doing whatever, that that's what I need to do. And that might not yeah. be actually where, where I was designed to serve. And so being able to kind of look to God and say, okay, what, what's mine to do and and what do I, what's it what is it okay for me to let go of because it's not all on me yeah I had a conversation with a very dear friend um this week who said why aren't you saying more about what's happening in Gaza um you know why aren't you speaking out why aren't you using your voice and the honest answer was because I don't have anything to add like in public I yeah. that I don't have anything to say that wouldn't feel like I was doing it as a performance. Yeah. 
I, I don't want to add a hashtag to a bunch of hashtags that doesn't feel honest. And maybe that's kind of moral cowardice, but it feels like it's come out of a similar journey as you of going, what is what is the work that is mine to do? What is my vocation? What are the, where my gifts meet the world's deep need, which I think is Niebuhr or. Um, mm-hmm. I think that was like, Howard Thurston. Pardon? I think it was Howard Thurston. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Let's go with that. I'm not going to Google it right I now. Know, I um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, ca- I can't, even even in something as cataclysmic as what's happening in Israel Gaza right now, I can't, I can't just pile on that thinking that I can be of some use. Yeah. I yeah. like, I can grieve it and pray for it and try and support the people in our community that are connected with all bits of it. And I can think about who are the refugees down the road from different countries that are not in the news at the moment and have them for dinner. But like, yeah, that, that, that that I felt I felt really the friendship's really good and it was a really healthy conversation mm-hmm. but that why are you not fight why are you not getting in the trenches with me I feel betrayed because you're not in these trenches with me is a really tricky thing to navigate in friendships yeah absolutely I mean I think that the Gaza the Israel Gaza thing is so tough because from my perspective I I think it it's well, I think from everyone's perspective, really, if they're honest, it's just this incredibly naughty situation where I'm suspicious of anyone who says that there's a clear right way to to solve the whole problem. And I'm like, I don't know what the solution is. Mm-hmm. I, I certainly, you know, I'm not the one to fix it. <laughs> and for me to say something in public, again, yeah, it would feel like a performance. And, and I don't think it would be really offering anything. Yeah. Um, what the approach I've tried to take and that I've, you know, suggested to some other people as well is when I see situations like this that are upsetting and causing a distress where realistically, I mean, yeah, I could give to like a, a charity for, you know, Palestinian children or, you know, something like that, but um, I can't solve that. I can't fix it is to reflect on it and say, okay, where am I seeing these problems that I'm seeing in this situation writ large? Where is it reflected in me and in my own life? And can I start to work on that? Because to me, I am quite mystical and that I do believe there is some sort of going into like woo pseudoscience, some kind of quantum entanglement, if you want to call it that, but where the things that we do within ourselves and within our own lives really do have ripple effects, Mm -hmm. sometimes in quite um, non-linear or non um, you know, not obviously causal ways, but even if you just want to think more rationally about it, just from from a a perspective that when I come into alignment in something, it affects my relationships and it it ripples outward from me. Mm. Um, and, and to me, that's really like when you know when Jesus says the kingdom of God is like yeast, it's kind of what he's talking about. It's like mm. this little organism that then multiplies and eventually yeah. spreads throughout the whole dough and so that's one way I've started I've personally just felt like okay this is how I can approach this right now because I've become personally increasingly skeptical of grandiose political programs that purport to solve all the problems of the world um and I've really just been trying to ask like how do I start to address the problem on the level of my own heart the human heart and how do I then maybe start to take it outward on a smaller scale. Like, like you said, the people in your neighborhood, the refugees down the street, you know, whatever. Um, yeah, so that was a really, um, I'm really enjoying this conversation. And uh, I am gonna turn now to our next segment, which is gonna be for my paid subscribers, which for any of you listening, you can find on Substack. We're going to talk a little bit about the uh, critiques that have come out of the sexual revolution and talk about what an authentic ethic of Christian or Christian ethic of sexuality might look like, what maybe a more secularized version of that might look like. We're going to have those conversations uh, behind the paywall, sorry, the paywall, but 
before we do that, Elizabeth, why don't you tell people a little bit about where they can find you and what you're up to? Thank you. Yeah, I um, uh, can be found uh, in many sites on the internet. Um, so my Substack is called Fully Alive. It's actually more fullyalive.substack. Um, and Instagram and Twitter are my main places. I try not to be on them very much and fail generally. Um, but uh, Substack, I can be reliably found. And I'm really enjoying that growing community and conversation. And I'd love to connect with listeners there. All right. Well, thank you.